Greetings. <laughs> Should I put a little more growl into it? <laughs> okay, I came yeah. back to, we spent 48 hours making puppets. <laughs> <laughs> making and breaking hearts, Ellinger. It's not that kind of podcast. On a practical level, <laughs> I have to remember what I was saying on a practical level. We should have a safe word. <laughs> Armageddon! I guess we're maybe semi-proud of that. Welcome to Hide and Create, your online writing workshop. Welcome back to another episode of Hide and Create. This week we're going to be talking about the fine art of giving feedback. With me are my co-hosts, Diana Rowland, Moses Siragar, and Joshua Esso, and, and I, of course, am Jordan Ellinger. So to start off, I thought that I would hit up our resident editor, Joshua Esso. Um, Joshua, are there tips or tricks that you use to make feedback more acceptable or easier to swallow with your clients? Yeah, and I had to think about this for a long time, and you know, there's always trial and error, but uh, writers are delicate flowers, and you have to make sure that uh, you give them water and not acid. So I... I hit on something that I think works fairly well. Instead of saying, um, if I get a particularly bad manuscript, instead of saying, wow, this is really bad, it would drive me absolutely bonkers to try and work on your manuscript, so I'm sorry, we're just not going to have to do that. Uh, I've discovered that that doesn't work well, and um, a better way to do it is to tell them exactly why it is not good for them to have a professional edit at this moment. Usually it's just cost. To take a manuscript that needs an enormous amount of work is going to cost them a lot of money, and that's just not worth it. If you're going to have an edit that's going to cost you, you know, two thousand dollars for a sixty thousand word manuscript, then you should probably consider maybe putting that money back into yourself instead of spending it on making that manuscript better. Go to workshops, buy books, do uh, online classes, that sort, that sort of thing. But spend money on yourself. Uh, make yourself grow as a writer by using that money a, a little bit more cost effectively that makes a lot of sense uh, Moses have you had the opportunity to, to give feedback in your career I do a lot of beta reading and I have a lot of beta readers that I like to use so um, I you know it, it's so tricky you know because I'm actually fairly diplomatic as a beta reader like I you know I'll, I'll give pointed comments but I'm not like a harsh beta reader uh, and yet I still think I have probably rubbed a couple people the wrong way, you know, just because writers are very sensitive animals, and to the point where, you know, I, I think it's funny, one of these people ended up writing a review of my own novel after my novel came out, and I, th- I felt like there was this kind of, like, leftover feeling of, like, well, you rejected my thing when you beta read it in private, <laughs> and now I'm <laughs> saying this sort of harsh thing about your book in public because then I, I talked to the person about it and then the person said well you had said this about my book you know when you did the beta read for it and I'm thinking really like you said that about my book in public because it's something I said to you in private and uh, and so I realized you know people I mean human beings don't like to be criticized don't like to be rejected and you know, any time you, you wade into any sphere where you're going to do that to someone, even if they're asking for it, even if they ask for really harsh feedback. I had one person one time who I, I said on a scale from one to ten, where one is the absolute soft kitty gloves and ten is you are my worst enemy and I hate you. How, how severe do you want my feedback to be when I read your book? And they said ten. And I said, you're serious. You want me to... <laughs> You want me to give you feedback as if I really despise you and I would say the meanest things I could say about you. And, of course, I didn't quite go that far, but the person said yes. And I'm like, okay. (laughs) (laughs) And so I was a lot harsher than I normally am because I don't normally do that in in a feedback scenario. Uh, and this person took it very badly. And I said, really? I, I checked with you to make sure you wanted the worst feedback you could get, you know, the most harsh feedback you could get. So p- human beings just don't like to be criticized. It, it, and, you know, occasionally you might find someone who really does have tough skin, but you can't assume everyone does because most people probably don't. And writers generally probably don't. So, you know, just I, I've just learned to be so careful about that. And that's why I don't write reviews of anyone else's book unless it's a five-star review, an honest five-star review. And if it's not an honest five-star review, I won't write the review. And that's another debate, and a lot of writers think that's, you know, lame and whatever. I just, I don't want to, 
I don't want to tick someone off. I don't know how someone is going to respond to a, f- a four-star review. Uh, most writers would l- welcome a well-thought-out, you know, four-star review. And some people might really take that personally and, you know, you ruin your friendship or they retaliate in some weird way. And it's like, I don't want to deal with that. Yeah, so- I'm with you. I'm with you. I, I just don't. I just don't go there because she just... It's one of these no good can come of it kind of things. But yeah, that's, yeah again, that's a discussion for another time. But I'm with you. Yeah. I agree yeah. completely. Just want to throw that in there. I, I don't do res- reviews either unless I can absolutely uh, back up a five star. Mm-hmm. One of the reviews, one of the rules that I live by is criticism in private, praise in public, right? And you don't necessarily, I'm not saying, you know, say these things are bad and then say the same thing, you know, in private, and then say the same things are good in public. You never lie. Right. But in private, you can emphasize constructive criticism, and in public, you emphasize the, the kind of different good things. Yeah. Right. That's a good rule. So, uh, Diana, have you, um, I mean, obviously, you must have done some beta reading as well. Oh, yeah, and, and actually quite a bit. Um, I... I've had critique partners. I've done some beta reading. Um, also, yes, I was coming up. I belong to a critique group, and I uh, now, um, for the past what, four or five years, I've attended the Rio Hondo uh, Writers Workshop, which is all like bestsellers and award winners. Um, my biggest thing is you really have to gauge your feedback on who the recipient is. Um, I got to meet. Uh, a guy recently who's just starting out with writing, who hasn't sold or submitted anything yet. He's he's just starting out, and he seems it's a, a a cop. And and I said, send me something, send me a sample of, of your work so I can take a look at it. And he said, okay, but really tell me what you think of it. Don't pull any punches. Well, of course I'm going to pull punches. I'm not going to be you know the velvet kitty gloves. But when I got it, I looked at it and I, and I wanted to find the good things about it. Turns out the guy is actually a pretty decent writer. Uh, thank goodness uh you know uh so i was looking at thinking of i can see like some flaws that are just inexperience um stuff that he he's, is going to be able to uh, get rid of with more practice and with some basic training and, and some workshopping and that sort of stuff and so that's what i address it's like you might want to try reading stuff your stuff out loud uh to get a better flow you might want to try this and that and the other um and so yeah, it was kind of kid gloves, but at the same time, I did try to address the problems that he had because you're not helping anyone uh, if you don't. And the whole point of feedback is to make writing better and to make someone a better writer. Now, when I'm writing critiques at the Rio Hondo uh, uh, Writers Group, that's completely different. These are people who've been through the mill. Uh, they've they've been through the rejection mill and feedback bill. They know how to give critiques. They know how to get critiques. Uh, and they know that you're critiquing the work and not the person. So you can pull, you know, you don't have to pull any punches, basically. You don't have to be a jerk. But at the same time, you can say, this part just absolutely didn't work for me, da da da. You can really dig in and get to the heart of, of what's wrong with it. And I know that when I'm there, that's what I want. I want people to say, this is the thing that's wrong with it, okay? This ugly thing in here. Uh, I, don't, I don't want them to say, you know, it's good, but it just didn't work for me. No, I want you to tell me what's wrong with it and how I can make it better. So, wow, Dan has just raised like a million really good points there. <laughs> One of the ones that I kind of got out of that was um, when you give feedback, it's not your job to correct the other person, right? Like you don't – it's not a battle. It's not an argument that you have to win. Right. right. You know, like if you think somebody's characterization was weak, you that, know, I mean, it might be weak for – I might think somebody's characterization is weak for a Jordan Ellinger story, but maybe that's not their voice, right? Maybe that's not the direction that they wanted to go with their story, right? So it's not my job when I'm giving feedback to to show them how to make the best Jordan Ellinger story ever. My job when I'm giving them feedback is, is to show them how to make the best story that they can write. Right, and, and also that's the one thing when receiving feedback, you want to get more than just one or two people giving you feedback and it depends on the person. There, there are some people who have twenty beta readers, and some people who have j- just two or three. Uh, me, I'm, I'm like you know three or four uh, because then it becomes a signal to noise ratio. But if one if one reader brings up something that they really don't like, um, and I disagree with them, then I kind of set it to the side. If every single reader comes up with the same point, even though I disagree. I have to step back and look at it. Mm-hmm. And so so that's a, a useful thing there. But even so, there are times when the readers will all say, well, I don't like this thing. And I step back and go, okay, I disagree, but I obviously have to 
to shape it or phrase it or present it in a different way um, so that it is more you know, acceptable or, or whatever. Or sometimes you just have to take the risk. But just because someone gives you feedback, says, this character should do this, I don't like that your character does this, doesn't mean you have to, to agree with them. The whole you know, point, it's, it, it's feedback and it's something to consider. It's funny, I've been in, in critique groups, though, where somebody is really concerned about a particular point, and they'll sit there and argue and actually get quite incensed with an author if that author disagrees with them or, or doesn't want to change them. No, you should do this in your story, otherwise your story is te- or terrible and stuff. Well, the, and that's, the, yeah, that's a sign of a bad critiquer, though. I mean, I really Well, do. exactly. The show is about giving critique, so I just want to say, if you find yourself arguing with somebody when you're giving them uh, feedback, right... Um, don't argue. Step back, right? It's not your job to, to you know, beat the truth into them. That's not what giving feedback is about. Um, the other thing that I wanted to kind of go off what Diana was saying um, is, is modifying your feedback to your audience. So with a beginning author, I'm less likely to say to them, well, you have to figure out, you know, how to use paragraphs more effectively. Um, I'm more likely to deal with kind of general craft things like, you know, look at your character's motivation through these scenes. Um, you know, your setting needs to be more developed because otherwise we're we're basically, this story is taking place in a white room. So I, I really try to do that with when I'm giving feedback is know my audience, know who they are as a writer and give feedback that will help them specifically. Do you do, you do that with your clients, Joshua? Yes, ab- absolutely. Um for the novice writers, I will tend to explain a lot more. Um, uh, you have to treat each audience, and for me, audience <laughs> kind of works out to be different writers sometimes, uh, according to who they are and what they do, what they know. So if I'm dealing with David Farland, for example, um, I'm not going to point out more than once that, hey, your ellipsis use is, is weird, you know. But if I'm working with a, um, uh, a, no, a more novice client or someone who I'm not familiar with, um, then I'm going to point it out every single time because I don't know how they work yet. I don't know if they're going to miss something. If I just put a note in saying, your ellipsis uses is, is strange, here are the rules for ellipses, uh, do this through the whole document. They might not be able to do that. So uh, that is one, one way that I'll you know work differently. Um, I noticed that with authors who are a lot more experienced, mostly I, what I'm going to be doing is content editing rather than a line editing because they've got pretty they've got pros that are in pretty good shape to begin with. Uh, with more novice writers, I find that I'm doing a lot more line editing, um, and that doesn't say that there's not content ed- editing to do for them. That just means that there's a lot of sentence structure stuff that needs to go on. Um, one of the biggest things that novice writers do, at least in my experience that I see, is they'll put sentences in slightly the wrong order or use a word that isn't quite precise enough and might lead some readers to think that you're saying one thing when you mean another. Um, so that takes a lot of time. Um, and then we go back to the cost effectiveness of you know getting a pro edit. Uh, That's funny. We do that kind of opposite, right? I was just saying earlier that um, with with novice writers, I focus more on the content and less on the line editing. Um, and the reason that I, I do it that way is because generally, um, the content, if it's a bad story, it doesn't matter how pretty it looks, right? So I just try to, to get them to, to have, you know, like whatever, a, a, a better story. And then the line editing, I figure I can do later on, or I can kind of do that quietly and send them out you know, proofs or something. Yeah, no, that, that is very interesting. Um, I think that the biggest reason for that is because when I do an edit for somebody, they don't usually pay me to do more than one edit. So they'll want mm. the whole shebang done all at once. Okay. Um, which, you know, admittedly can be difficult sometimes because if there are a lot of content editing things that need to be done to fix a story, then the line editing becomes, you know, obsolete. There's, it was a waste of time. But what I do when I encounter a situation like that, and, I, and I've had to do this a number of times, is you know I'll get to a certain point in the book and I'll just be like, you know, too many things are coming up content-wise that would make the line editing completely useless. So what I'll do is I'll either continue doing the work and only work on content, or I will send the whole uh, manuscript back to them with everything that I've done so far, let them do whatever they want to do to it, and then we'll resume once they've finished. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Donna, have you done any editing as well? or? Uh, no, not really. Um, no. Do you, 
Do you want to talk a little bit about your Clarion West experience, just because we might have a lot of listeners that are at that point in their career? Yeah, it's actually that that model of critique of critique group um, is one that Rio Honda uses, and a, a lot of critique groups use. Basically, uh, however many people you have, the person being critiqued cannot say anything while. Each person takes their turn giving critique. At Rio Hondo, I think everyone get, uh, gets two minutes or three minutes. It's timed where you have a certain amount of time to, to, li- to deliver your critique. And so you sit there and listen and you can take notes. You can only speak if you have a specific question of clarification, like are you talking about the such and such, or that sort of thing. And then everyone goes around and gives their critique. When they're done, then the writer can respond, question, argue, and then usually it turns into – a discussion a lot of times of the story, the concepts, or whatever. Uh, but I think that's very important. You were talking earlier about uh, critiquers arguing with the writer, and you know, if you have that model, the Clarion model, which I think is actually a something else model, and I'm, and I'm blanking on it, um, I think it runs a lot more efficiently. Everyone gets their turn to critique, and sometimes people build off of other critiques, like, yeah, that what that person said, plus this, or I disagree with so-and-so because of this. And with a good group, it's it's great. It's a great way to really dig into your writing and not necessarily just critiquing that particular story, but your writing style and and things that you do with lots of different stories. Um, your, your personal issues sometimes. Um, and it gets it can get inter- interesting. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, uh, well, uh, a point that you have touched on here is that uh, don't ever argue. Um, that was hard for me at first because I was like, well, you're just not understanding. Let me explain to you again. And they're like, no, no, no. And I was like, well, well let me try explaining this a different way. And they go, no, 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 I hate it. <laughs> now, the, only, the only exception to the arguing so to speak is if it's the editor who has paid you a bunch of money for this book if it's your editor saying this is the thing you should do and you violently disagree you have to work with that um, because you can't just not do it and at the same time if you violently disagree or if you even mildly disagree you can't just really roll over you have to come to an agreement about that and and basically that means you have to discuss it with your editor and say okay well here's the thing I disagree because of this because it will affect this and this and if you have a good editor hopefully you have a good editor then you'll be able to have a discussion and they'll say well I understand that but it comes across like this why don't we try this or you can say why don't we try this Um, that's the one time where not so much an argument but you need to at least have a discussion if uh, your editor comes up with something because usually if they're paying you a bunch of money usually they know what they're doing um, usually, you, um, and, I, and I am qualifying with that with usually. But but if you do have an editor uh, who, who has a good reputation and everything else, um, it's worth listening, discussing, whatever, because you want them to continue to pay you. For myself, I learned that I don't ever argue anymore, I, ever, unless I'm asked to, unless I'm asked for clarification. Then we can get into it. Right, but you're in a slightly different situation. You're not representing the publisher. Um, exactly. Yeah, so it's a totally different situation for you. Yeah. And thank God. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> um, Moses, you were talking earlier about your kind of 1 to 10 scale. If somebody asks for a 1, which which is the mildest possible critique, as I understand it, um, what techniques would you use to soften the blow? It's a pretty font. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're pretty. You know, I, <laughs> I um I think I've only put that to maybe one or two people, and I think I probably stopped doing it after that one person asked for a ten, and then didn't really want a ten. Um, but I mean, if, if it was if it was super kid gloves, you know, I would just I, I I would just be really 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 careful about everything I said. You know, I would just. Uh, I, you know, I, honestly, if they asked for a one, I probably wouldn't give them very pointed feedback because that that's saying I cannot handle criticism. And if we're just doing an informal beta reading thing between friends, I would I would not step on their toes in any way at all if they said one. You know what I mean? But no one has ever said that to me. But then again, I probably only asked a couple people that scale. Yeah, I'd um, wonder why they were asking for feedback if they only want a one, anyways. Right. Yeah. I, I did think of something else. Um, this is slightly going back to the previous topic, as far as like uh, 
receiving rejection, but when you get beta feedback from people or from an editor, you know, that's another thing that I've learned, you know, is you you also don't really want to argue with them. You know, it's like someone takes the time to do a free beta read for you, let's say, and they send you all this stuff and like, you know, maybe they were kind of jerks about it or something, you know, but there's that tendency to want to defend yourself and be like, well, no, my character is good and blah, 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 right? And and you can't, (laughs) you know, you, you, you you just have to go, Thank you for your feedback. You know, and, yeah, that's exactly, um, that's excellent that's exactly thing to say. It's you, you know, you get the beta readers, um, and they, they have. It takes a lot of time to beta read even a story or a novel, or anything else. And uh, yeah, when when you get it, you read it. Even if you don't agree with stuff, you say thank you very much for taking the time out and doing this. If they don't give an effective feedback or critique, or if it's really of no use to you, you don't use them again, and you find someone else. Or you know, yeah. It's yeah, funny, as an editor, sometimes I, I get authors explaining their stories to me. I'll, I'll say, I don't get what happened on page two. Where, where is this motivation coming from? And so the writer will then write me this fairly long, like a page-long explanation of what the character was thinking and how it led to that. <laughs> you know, and I, I say to them, well, <laughs> unless you're going to yeah. talk to every reader and give them that same explanation, put that in the story, yeah. right? Put that in your so, footnotes. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. So, like, <laughs> arguing with feedback isn't isn't helpful often especially if i'm an editor i'm giving you feedback generally that's because the people that i represent and i do represent a certain readership right every editor out there represents their readership um my reader if i don't get it my readership won't as well and you just can't write that note to every every all of my readership you need right. to let that speak through the story so um, we're just going to wrap up here a little bit let me say one um, thing here about what the, your point that you just made go. um yeah, always say thank you uh, for somebody taking time to give you uh, their time and their feedback and stuff like that. Uh, even if you completely disagree with it, the, I mentioned in the last show where I had the assistant to an author, you know, give me feedback on some editing that I did for them. And even though the feedback that I got was like absolutely ridiculous, I mean, it was really laughable. I said. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate the amount of time that you spent doing this for me. Uh, you know, I'll talk to you later. Uh, in the meantime, you know, I ground my teeth for a day going, what? <laughs> turned yep. into a, a giant green rage monster. But <laughs> you spend a lot of time talking like Cookie Monster, don't I, you? I yeah. do. I spend a lot of time talking like Cookie therapy. Monster. <laughs> it, it really is. Uh, but then I got over it, right? You get over it, you move on, go on to the next thing. Yeah, I have I have these like sadistic beta readers apparently sometimes, and like they're cool people, they're good writers, they're friends in a lot of cases, and yet like their feedback will just come across as so like caustic. Is that the right word here? It's just like, Ew, like why did you say it like that? <laughs> you know, like, and, and 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 you know, and I, and it's like just taking blow after blow. You're just like boom, punch in the face, boom, punch in the face, and then you get to the end and you go. Thank you so much for reading this. I really appreciate it. I really learned a lot, and I can't tell you that you were a dick. You know. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah. Thank you for beating the heck out of me. You know, and then so I may or may not use you again in the future. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. So final thoughts. Uh, I'm just going to go from Diana to, to Moses to, and then we'll end with Joshua, who's our heavyweight editor, uh, with this. So Diana, do you have any uh, final thoughts on giving feedback? You can learn a lot giving feedback. You do want to weight your feedback according to the skills of the writer uh, who you're uh, critiquing. But also you have to balance it with what works and what doesn't work. And um, if they don't like your feedback, it's not a reflection on you. Great. Moses? Yeah, I want to clarify what I was saying about um, that. how I only write five-star reviews for other books. Because uh, I've had this di- sort of discussion before on the Internet. And uh, I, 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 now I remember what people say when you say that. Is they say, well, but then you, know, you have to write all, all sorts of star reviews or else the reviews don't matter. And people won't trust your reviews if you only write five-star reviews and things like that. Um, so... You know, everyone has their own point of view on it. I'm not saying there's a right or wrong way to do this. I'm just saying this is what I what I do and what what I think is best for me. Um, and it's that as a writer, I don't want to write other low star reviews. If I was a book reviewer, of course I would write you know all all sorts of reviews because that's my job is to review books honestly and and give one to five stars. Uh, if I was just a reader, I would write 
whatever. But as an author, as the guy who you know has peers who also write books, often in the same genre that I'm writing and the things that I'm reviewing, that's where I just sort of take the cover my butt philosophy. And in public, like Jordan was saying, I, I say generally praise, generally nice things. I can point out things that I thought were maybe weaker areas, but you know, that's not really the the main thing that I'm doing there. Uh, so anyway, it's just that I just want to clarify that that's just what I do as an author, you know, just to cover myself and not tick anyone off and and not create any enemies and not ruin any friendships and uh but to each his own that's just how i do that and i just wanted to clarify that great thank you for that sorry thank you for that clarification um all right so i guess i'll just whip in here with my final thoughts about uh giving feedback um just make sure that you're helpful right that's that's feedback that's a lot of people forget that and they just want to give all of the feedback and point out every wrong thing about the work and even as an editor as an acquiring editor where I'm actually buying things uh, for, for from writers I don't point out every little minute thing that's wrong with their work because I want my feedback to be helpful and sometimes if you just beat somebody into the dust they don't take anything that you they're, they're too numb to be able to take any of your feedback Right, so make sure that you're helpful. Make sure that your feedback is targeted, and uh, make sure that it's not overwhelming. And and just just to just restate what you just said, you know, if you if you if you see a lot of problems in a work, sometimes it's better to point out one or two or three things that are the main things rather than try to hit them with ten things because then everything gets lost. Exactly, they can't hear anything if you just beat them over the head that many times. If you're just yelling at them. They, they can't hear... You they'll, know, they'll turn whatever. you out. They'll just turn you out. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, Joshua, final thoughts? Um, as opposed to what you just said, I will target every little thing that you do. <laughs> <laughs> but that's your job. That's a different... But that's my yeah. job, yeah. 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 And, but also, a big part of what I do is to make sure that you, as the writer, know what you did right. Um, throughout manuscripts that I edit, I make sure to put in personal comments and they're like, oh wow, this really affected me, you made me smile, you made me laugh at this part, the tension's really high here, or put in little notes like, oh no, what's going to happen next, you know? Because that's the kind of thing that when I get feedback on my own writing, I love to see that, you know? Oh god, it, the, the, yeah, the little smiley faces, you live yeah. for faces. <laughs> it, boy, it boys you uh, back up after you get all the, wow, this really doesn't work. This sentence is really confusing. You know, you go through a couple pages of that and you find yourself starting to feel deflated and deflated and deflated. <laughs> so part of um, what I do is I try to make sure that the writer knows what they're doing right. Um, don't take any of the criticism personally because it's not about you as a person. It is about the work and that's it. Um, don't take advice uh, from every person that you hear, I think the uh, Diane, I think that you said this earlier. Don't take advice from every person that you hear, unless you start hearing the same feedback uh, over and over again. Unless, big caveat, unless the one person who notices a certain thing is a pro in the field, is an editor, perhaps, because then it's worth considering. Um, remember, if the work is any good at all, we want you to succeed. You know, regardless of whether the work is good, we still want you to su- succeed. Unless we're being total dicks, we've had a bad day or, or whatever, and we're not good editors, then we want you to make a good book, and we want to help you do that. Our advice so, sometimes is terse. It isn't meant to beat you down. It's only meant to improve you. Uh, take control of your rejections and make, and make yourself more awesome because of them, and then try again. I have worked with Joshua. I've hired him as an editor, and he's helped me with my works. And he's, he walks his talk on this. He's very good. You know, every time he has edited my works, you know, I come away with a positive feeling about the work. And he's also very pointed when there are weaknesses that need to be improved. And he's very good at pointing those out. But he's also very good at pointing out the things that are good. And so I've come away feeling good about that experience. And I have worked with other editors where it wasn't quite like that, where their feedback was pointed and good and, and accurate. But the way it was delivered was too, eh, a little, not, didn't really come across that well. And it kind of le- left him with a bad feeling. And so. He he walks his talk on this, and I just wanted to give you that little that little uh, feedback there. Five star review. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And I, actually, I'm going to exercise my host's prerogative here um, and just and cut in with 
final, final thoughts. Crap sandwich. I can't believe nobody mentioned it. I was thinking crap sandwich because we, I didn't mention yeah. it because you'd mentioned it on another episode, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So crap sandwich is basically, I, I try to do this in, in almost all of my uh, feedback is I'll start with something very positive and then put the kind of, the, you know, like the crap, that's the bread, that's the positive thing. And then I'll put the crap, which is the negative thing. Uh, in the middle, and then I'll try to close with a positive as well, which is the bread. And that generally, you know, some when people read the feedback, they they read that good thing, and then that gets gets them into a good, constructive, open mood. And then they read the the stuff that needs to be fixed, and they're more likely to say, okay, well, yeah, sure. Oh, you had a point in recognizing my brilliance earlier on. So maybe that's <laughs> a point in recognizing this. And then, you know, they've gotten so down by the end of the feedback when I've pointed out all these things they need to fix, I, I leave them with a with a nice positive and they're back and they're like, Okay, well maybe I can fix this. It's not all it's not all terrible. So crap sandwich, that's the way to go. So <laughs> that's that's our show for the week. Tune in next week for a discussion uh, about health and fitness as a writer. So long for now. And remember, you're all beautiful and pretty. This has been another episode of Hide and Create. The show is produced by me, Jordan Ellinger. The site is edited by Joshua Esso. And your co-hosts have been Diana Rowland and Moses Sergar. That music that you're listening to was written by Jason Donnelly. We can be reached at writingpodcastonline.com, where you can ask us questions and suggest topics for future shows. Thank you for listening. Now go hide and create some.